Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for moving rooms. I think it's good we switched air. Um, because it's 115, I think most of you heard the introduction. This is Dr. Olga Scrivener, a research scientist at the Cyber Infrastructure for Network Science Center, School of Informatics and Computing and Engineering at Indiana University faculty fellow at the Center of Excellence for Women in Technology, and a corporate faculty in data analytics at Harrisburg University of Science and Technology. Um, she's going to give a two-hour workshop on data visualization with Shiny, and I'm part of UCIT Research and Development uh, in tandem with the UC Libraries. This series is part of the Data and Computational Science series. We have more coming in 2019, so keep your eye out and come join us again. Thank you. All right. Thank you for staying to the second talk, if you've done, uh, or welcome to uh, this talk. And I'm very excited that I can share finally with a big crowd my passion to Sandy and R as well. And objective to, for today, I'd like you to. Um, of course, some of you already know some R and Shiny, but the, the goal for today is just to learn not just the basics and um, maybe explore Shiny templates, but I also would like you to take away from today point is that you can use it not only for your research, you can use it for your teaching as well. Or if you're a student, you can use it for your own um, project. All right. <coughs> this is today material. If you have that link available or type it in, We'll get back to we'll get to the link one more time when you need to download uh, if you don't have chance yet. But truly, you have two zip files that I'd like you to have available, and uh, slides will be posted after workshop uh, as well there. And there's a couple of useful links that I just like to share with you. All right, everybody got the link. All right, if not, I can remind you a little bit later on. So first of all, our Studio Basic. If you've done it before, if you know everything, uh, consider it just um, take a nap, all right? Let me go quick through those. So our studio is open source, and it's just a set of different tools. Don't think of R anymore as a programming language. Think of R as more like a set of tools that you can build different things with. And Shiny is just simply a package that belongs to R. Uh, and both of them work together to build creative, interactive visualization and application. All right. So Truly, you need, and hopefully you have, right, our base and uh, our studio here. And uh, why our studio? Because it's just a useful graphical interface. Like 10 years ago, nobody was using our studio because it didn't exist. So it makes sense to kind of use that. And if you're familiar with your computers or desktop, great, you can locate, navigate to our studio. If not, typically in PC, you may look for a start button, or maybe you already have your shortcut. So you just open our studio. So if everyone can open our studio and raise the hand if you have it in front of you uh, open. Mm -hmm. um, we actually do have some people in the room who would be lovers to help people. Okay. So I wonder if I can just introduce more comments. Great, that would be great. <coughs> Excellent. Excellent, because I was going to volunteer somebody else, but excellent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, our studio screen that you have right now in front of you should be like this, unless you've been working on your own computer and it looks different. So basically, you have a, like a three different uh, panels, uh, and we'll talk a little bit later. This is your console, on the command line, uh, workspace, and file. Let's talk about how to open new files so that we have full perspective of your R Studio. So let's go to the file, new file, and R script. You may see a lot of other options, but for today, right now, we'll be using R script. So the first practice for today will be very difficult task to open our file. So file, new file, R script. All right. And you probably, uh, if you've been working with R, you know that that R is the typical extension, right, for R scripts. So your computer recognizes that extension. All right. So now, if you have it successfully open, right, you have your four display panels. Everybody got four? Anybody get five? No, we shouldn't be there. All right. Okay. So the panel one is left where we type and edit scri uh, scripts. Of course, you can actually reshuffle and change panels the way you want, 
or remove the one you don't want, but let's stick to just four typical panels that we work with. So panel one, typing, editing, scripts, mm -hmm. that's where your uh, script, mm -hmm. the new script that you open mm -hmm. should be, right? The panel two is where our console and command line type thing shows up. Panel three, important thing where you have history logs. If you type something today and look tomorrow at your logs, you remember the command that you typed yesterday. So it's a good place to find the history. And number five is where we view plots, install packages, and ask for help. It's like a help panel. All right, for source. So if you all focus your attention on the left top panel, right? So this is our scripting or editing part. So if you notice, if you have, um, just for the future, we'll practice to run anything in R from here. Uh, do you like running, by the way? Anybody here like running, jogging? So it's easy for you to remember. To run command in R, you click run, all right? Okay, so this is your run button, and it's on the top left panel. All right, let's move to the console, which now focus your attention to the left bottom. That's where things show up when you start running your script. It should be blank right now, all right? The, now shift your attention to the right panel, the very top. That's where your history and also environment. So if you load something into our memory, it shows up there. If you work specifically and strictly with the console part, which by the way, which corner of the RStudio? Left. Left, bottom. All right, if you type something there, command will be executed, but it will not stay in the memory. So it will not be showing up. So you can do it if you just calculate something, but if you need to really save in the memory, run, uh, use a script and um, other things. All right, so this is an environment. And let's shift your attention to the bottom right. Uh, extremely useful panel because it allows you install different libraries, <coughs> view your plots, and cry for help if you need. So this is a special help um, option that allows you to read about different things in R, all right? So let's look at libraries. So in our bottom right panel, we have something that's called packages. So treat package as a library, all right? And that's where you probably can see a 10 or 20 different uh, library installed. They came by default. However, and we'll see Shiny, it's a library that you need to install, and I'll show you how. To, um, also, it allows you to see what's been active or not active. So think of R as a tool with a lot of options. And it doesn't want to turn everything on unless you ask for it. So for instance, here you can practice and click on and off to activate, deactivate package. Just select one random package and click on that uh, little square uh, option. Deactivate and activate. And you'll see that it's been active or uh, deactivated. So that's how you can do it and use this for, um, for your current session. Tomorrow you don't need this package, so for instance, you don't need to install it. All right. for um, Another important thing before we jump into Shiny is to set up working directory because R needs to know where your files are or where to put the files that you create, for instance. And let's practice um, setting up directory. But for that, I would ask you to create a folder for today workshop and put those uh, zip files in it. Maybe name something Shiny Workshop. So you can use desktop if you'd like. So create a folder in desktop, for instance. Name it workshop. Put all your zip files in it. Then, when you're done with creating folder, you're going to point R to this specific folder. So what you do is you will go to session, set working directory, Choose directory, and please choose the fo folder that you just created. And that's how R will know exactly where the files are. And if you have any questions, we have three uh, bright volunteers here walking and looking for your uh, hand.
right. And this is important, and we'll do it one more time a little bit later today. All right, are you successful setting up directory? Yes, no, and you also have those zip files in that directory? All right. You will extract that. You can, um, yeah, I will ask to extract. Okay, so I kind of just did that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's fine. Yeah. And uh, if you're done with this task, feel free to go in and zip those files. Because I forgot to mention, you could, uh, you unzip those files. All right. Are we ready? Okay. So the last thing we'll look at uh, with respect to our uh, configuration is we need to know how to open and save files. And again, this is basic for those who uh, already know, uh, just let uh, other uh, learn it. So we will open file through file, for instance, open file. And you already have one file open, right? What you need is to save it. So to save that file, you use the same file panel, go to save, and it will ask you to name this untitled.r that you have right now. Name it, maybe um, script one, workshop one. Don't forget dot r signify it's r script. Don't forget to do that. So after it's saved, now tell me where that file is dropped when it's saved. In the directory to which you establish this uh, working directory. That's why that was important, because if you did save it prior establishing working directory, it will be somewhere by default in different parts of your computer, and you'll have to find it. In this case, you just know exactly where the file is going to be saved. All right. So this is a portion where I'm okay. you open save files. All right. Good. And feel free to raise your hand if it's too fast or too slow, or um, you can't hear me, or you just want to throw a tomato at me, or I don't know. <laughs> just uh, joking. All right. How do you feel about our basic? You good to go? Check mark? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's talk about Shiny basic. All right. Let me uh, describe you the framework, what Shiny is and how it works. So first of all, you all sit in front of your computer, right? And you have your um, R Studio somewhere here installed, right? You don't have Shiny package yet, but you will eventually. So whatever you create here, as far as application, will get deployed to the server, or it could be local, or it could be a server uh, online that anyone can access. And when you do that, actually what's interesting is, it becomes your URL interactive, and that's why it's called web application. It's literally application <coughs> sitting in a web browser. But what's interesting about it, the usage of this application is unique per unique user who access this application. Let's say, uh, what's your name? Car. Car? Yeah. Okay. So let's say Car create application for machine learning, all right? And he share uh, the application with everybody here. And in that application, you, for instance, select different features, <coughs> maybe uh, different input files and output files. But guess what? Everyone have different uh, look because it works on your individual browser. So car will not see what you're doing with this application. You'll be working as like your tool in your own browser, even though it's online. It's kind of a very neat uh, feature. You can have uh, multiple collaborators working the same application using different um, input data, for instance. All right? So this is how it works. <coughs> it goes to the server, it goes to the browser, which is user interface. And if you know HTML, uh, and if you know JScript, for instance, you can make a beautiful, very um, amazing application in the future. So if you came with a background with HTML, don't you know move it away. It's going to be useful for this type of application as well. And if you're JavaScript developer, hey, you're going to be uh, most wanted person in uh, maybe in, in two or maybe one year. By the way, Shiny developer is becoming very relevant in a lot of new job postings require uh, skills as a Shiny developer, for instance. So anyway, okay. Um, this is just examples that I, to give you a little bit of uh, inspiration that I provided also in, um, in uh, language variation WordPress with the links. So feel free to uh, explore when you have chance. For instance, a gallery 
those uh, selected uh, templates or selected application by our studio. So they're very beautiful and very, um, I would say, useful, uh, developed by other people. Show me shiny, it's more individual collection if you have something to share. Uh, you have links to the GitHub. This is a good way to, if you're starting building your own application, to look for inspiration and also to look for code to use or see, learn how to build it. So it's a very useful place to start uh, because somebody else may have built already the same type of application that you can see how it's built, maybe modify for your own needs. All right? An interactive dashboard, I really like this example because it shows you, it's almost like a web page, website for uh, tourism, government tourism, I already forgot where, but uh, yep, uh, okay, and it gives you all the statistic metrics you need, but it's also a website, so it's kind of neat. So you can build diff different uh, well-designed application as well. All right, now let's install Shiny. Remember, it's a package, so we have to focus back to our bottom uh, right portion, and this time we need to install Shiny. So to do so, we go to install. We're going to select install. And when we select install, we see the window pops up. And we start typing shiny, all small letters. When you start typing, sometimes you have um, um, suggestions. Feel free to select. Or just type shiny. And while you type in it, I'm going to explain uh, on the top you have installed from repository CRAN. This is a typical traditional uh, bucket of all the official packages that our studio um, distribute. If you ever need to install package that provided by someone on GitHub, you'll have option to install from zip file, for instance. But for now, we need to keep default, which should be on all of your uh, machines CRAN repository. We also will keep installed dependencies because each package may come with additional dependency that will be pulled in at the same time. And you should keep the installed to library by default. I truly never bother unless it's something specific to computer, but keep the default. All right, so let's click on install. All right, and now look at your libraries or packages. See if you can find, scroll down and find Shiny in it. And when you scroll down, and this is again our bottom right panel, so if you scroll down to S, Shiny, if you see it, click on it, it activates the package. And my volunteers, let's walk through around and see if everyone able to have Shiny successfully installed. And also <coughs> click on the library. And me meanwhile, you can scroll down and see what other libraries or packages you have actually installed in the, by default. Don't worry, we will not move it forward unless everyone successfully installs Shiny. This is the gist of this workshop. Yeah, but I say it's copied the extract that we 
the one from the website. Okay, so that's a separate thing. We don't need to worry about that. We're installing the package. We're installing the package. We're going to go back to our studio. Loading a little bit slow. Uh, we'll get back to it. Make sure it's fixed. All right. Let's. Uh, those of you and and here I'll ask for your uh, collaboration. If a person next to you for some reason their shiny is not running yet, maybe you can combine your efforts and do this uh, demonstration example together in one computer. So if, for instance, your shiny is not loaded yet, work together to look at examples. So what I'd like you to do is to go to your script that you have on top left panel, all right? So now we're focusing to the top left editor part. And I'd like you, on the first line, the very first line, type. What are you going to type? You're going to type run, small letters. Example, E, cap, e capital. Just make sure the um, spelling is correct. And in parentheses, I'd like you to add in quotes what's here, 04 underscore MPG. This is just an example of already um, giving kind of shiny app that we're going to run first. and then maybe we can fix it later. All right, remember how to run things in R? You need to locate this run button on the top of your script editor. So your cursor can be placed anywhere on the first line, as long as it keeps uh, itself on the first line, or you can just highlight the entire, but truly keeping cursor anywhere that works, and then click run. Just make sure Shiny is active, right? Make sure you click Run right on the line where you type Run Example. Make sure you spell correctly. And if you do that successfully, then you get demo in your browser. So let's see if we get to this point. You got it. You might want to work together. Yeah. 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 Because so you guys in 
morning sun. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I did the same thing. So you're administrative. You're not allowed to download things. So you need to sign out and then sign in using the lib patron. I did the same thing. Excellent. So uh, if you're still running in trouble with shiny download, that means you have to um, do different login because you didn't have administrative rights to download something. So if everybody else is great, do you have application in the browser? Yeah. All right. Are you yeah, able? Right click on that. Yeah. And then click the power, the little power button. Yeah, that button. Uh, can I see for just a second? Okay. And then you have to sign in using this username and password up here, and I'll get you back up. It won't be that bad. Um, are you comfortable? Yeah. Do you think you can help him get you back up? Thank you so much. All right. Okay, raise your hands if you have web application pop up in your browser. And raise your hands if you're happy. <laughs> All right, great. Now, if you notice, uh, why is it called interactive? Why is it called reactive? Because if you change something here, it changes ultimately and immediately in the image here, in the graph. And you also you notice it's reactive, interactive, but independent. Whatever you change in your browser, car will not see, for example, right? And uh, so it depends on your browser. I'm gonna tell you one little secret. The weakness of Shiny lies in the browser. If you have a very big application that requires a lot of data, it may slow down your processing just because the browser have limitations. So it's something to keep in mind and figure out how to avoid that. All right. Good. Can, now, can I ask a quick yeah, question about sure. that? So is the browser itself, like what is the slowdown? Is the, is the, is the user? The browser has a memory also, like a, a limitation. A limitation on the memory, but the computation of rendering, for example, a graphic is occurring off-site at the server side? It's better when it's done in the back end, but not, like for instance, this application, the calculation that's done on the kind of browser portion. On the browser, so each of our computers is calculating and, and rendering yep. this mm -hmm. yep. So for big computational powerful application, you do a lot of computation built outside, like in the back end, and then just drop the data into the application. Yeah. But otherwise, you'll notice if you do some kind of topic modeling, uh, if you have a lot, it's going to be small because it's not built for that. It's a good question. Yeah. All right. Good. Now, how to stop application? Let's say you're tired of it. So there is, if you notice, a stop sign. So click on that stop sign. When you click on that stop sign, look what is happening in your browser. It should be turning gray. I mean, it's not active. All right. So that's something to keep in mind. If it turns gray, it means you have to start application again. So make sure you know where the stop button is, and that's in the left uh, bottom corner in your console. So navigate, locate the stop button, and stop uh, application. Then look at the browser, and it should turn gray. Yeah. It could be quitting or it could be turning gray. Perfect. Do you need help to help No, I, I, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, As I you already talked to him. Uh -huh. He said it's an administration problem. Oh. So I can't use it. You can work with, okay. Yeah, sorry about, yeah. How do you make that? So right now I stream the stop button. So it turned out 
an example. Yeah, I'm trying to do second time. Okay. All right. So if you um, accidentally make some new lines of your script and you want to run your application again, make sure to run something. Your cursor needs to be on the same line where wherever you want to run is. So if you want to run application, which I'm going to ask you again, you have to um, do it again. All right. So you know how to stop application. Now I'm going to ask you to run application one more time. And I'm going to show you a couple of things uh, behind the web application. All right. So run this application again. Get to your browser with the application. And hopefully you have a script on the bottom or on the right side next to it. So make sure you all have this uh, kind of R script yeah. next to the application. Yeah, it could be on the bottom or it could be on the left. That's what we're going to look at. All right. So if you notice, we have, what do we have? We have script that's called app.r. So we know it's R script. Then we have two libraries. So the second way to activate library is to type library and then name of the library. What you did initially, you went to the packages, right, panel, and just click on and off. But when you write script, you want to do it automatically, and you already present information for the script, what li library to load automatically. All right, that's the first couple of lines. And it's already pulling two libraries. One is Shiny, one is data sets, which by default installed, should be installed on your computer, so we shouldn't be uh, worried about that. Now, if you notice something, uh, you have a lot of green color, right? Those are comments. And in R, to comment something out is to use hashtag in front of that line. So all this, if you notice, have hashtags, and those things that do not get processed by the computer. This is where you put all your documentation or comments, personal comments. All right. So this is first part. Now, let's all focus on the graphic, which is our box plots. I'm going to ask you first personally, can you spot outlier on this graph? Do you see outlier? How many? How many outliers? One, and it's right there, right? OK. Uh, stay focused for a second. Uh, we are going to scroll down. Uh, the script is a little bit long. So scroll down to the very end of the script, to the end where it says create shiny app. Just scroll down and wait. I'll show you how reactivity works. OK, so we all need to go to the bottom of the script, make sure uh, of course, if you look in, you can total on and off this show below or show on the bottom or show up. So I don't know which way it works better for you. Okay. Are we there at the bottom of the script? Yes? All right. Now, I will ask you, like at the magician show right now, you will focus in your attention at this portion where it says render plot. All right? Focus your attention on that part. Now look at the left upper corner of the app where it says outlier and has a little um, box to it. So it's something like uh, below uh, variable. OK, do you see that option, outlier? OK, now before you do anything, OK, keep your focus on this box and click outlier on and off. You should be able to see yellow color pops up on your script when you click outlier on and off. What it is, it's reactive script. It shows where all the uh, work is done. So try to play again and make sure you focus on this uh, render plot. I don't know, do you see that color uh, highlight? So if you don't see it, maybe you have to scroll down. 
segments of the script highlighted. All right. Let's see what's happening there. First of all, that's what we have. We have our box changed because we changed uh, our variable. What's next? We have, uh, and by the way, um, output caption, it's this. It, it, it depends, it's rendering some text that come from some formula. But where's the formula? Look above, we have formula text, and it says reactive. So it, it functions, it works on the go, all right? What it does, it pasting together mpg tilde with something that comes from the user. And what comes from the user? The input variable. So if you change that input, your text will change with your caption. The text also will be changed in your box plot because box plot also depends on this formula. So all those three are related and based on reactive kind of chain. As soon as you as a user change something, it gets that changed reactively and immediately. Now, something else too, you notice. You have two different things. You have input and output. So what we're doing here, input, and it's conveniently call here is input with dollar sign and output <coughs> is what? Our caption and output is also our plot. So those things that get projected in the browser. Not necessary that you have, you have output. You may have function that run behind but if you want to show something that becomes your output. If you want to take something in from user, use input. In some cases you may not need input you may just um, have your own file there sitting forever and you just use the same file. In that case, you don't really need input. It will be just a um, file data set already built in. All right, so two important concepts, input and output. All right, any questions? Good. Uh, I think now you're ready to go ahead and unzip, if you haven't done so, the word cloud.zip. And I will ask you, as an additional practice, to set up your directory now to change to that folder, the zip folder. So you have to do the same kind of routine practice. It's good for us to practice. We do doing set working directory. We choose directory. And that directory should point to this word cloud folder that you just unzipped. All right, do that. If you finish uh, setting up directory, now I'd like you to scroll down in what's inside, what's the content of this folder, and I'd like you to find a file that's called ui.r, which will stand for user interface.r. So if you find, it's perfect, it should be there. Okay, do you remember how to open file in R? 
So I'll ask you to go to file, open file, and open this file ui.r. That's your next goal. So we open the file from the folder that's called ui.r and you click open. to open file, then you should see something like this. And let me know uh, what do you see as a huge change in your running option? What does it say? It says run app. So if you have that option, you're golden, you have everything installed you need, and R is working properly. That's what it should. It recognizes that now your R script is turned into a shiny kind of app. So that's important to understand the difference. Now, before you click on run app, I'm going to tell you a couple of things. You can run application locally in our window, which will be basically what uh, your right bottom panel is, kind of small little window. You can run app as a um, R viewer pane, it's like additional pane, and some of you probably have seen it, um, it's like a mini browser. Or you can run it externally, which goes to your default <coughs> browser. So whatever default browser in those computers, that's where it goes. Usually, browser version is better, it's larger than those mini panes, and I'd like you to click on run app little arrow menu, and select run external they will give us option to send our application to the browser. All right. So select that. After you select run external, then run your app. Then click run your app. And then I'll walk around to see and make sure also that you have that. All right. If uh, you're missing some packages, uh, it's a good error. So if somebody is missing something and it says TM, then you need to download uh, install package. So let's do the practice again. Go to package, call TM, install TM package. Then rerun your app. Oh, 
So you know how you install the other packages? Sometimes you may have 
files attached to your application. And if you look at your folder with the word cloud, you'll see the bunch of files there, right? So those files get pulled in and processed by server.r and displayed by ui.r. That's kind of workflow. You may see something that's called global.r. There's something that some functions can be uh, written uh, overall global function. Not specific to each function, but if you want to have a file that work for the entire app, you may write a global.r where you say, upload this file. And it passes itself to the server, and it goes to your UI. So you might want to look to global.r and server.r, which is all in the same folder. And find where it says, like, a data set. Yeah, perfect. All right, so if you look at the layout, you can build different uh, versions of layout. But typical, when you start, you probably see what? Sidebar panel. Just look at your application. You have sidebar panel. You have title panel. And you have a main panel, where all the uh, good stuff happening, all right? Now, can you together work and identify in that R script that you have in your R Studio? Now, work with the script in R Studio, and script should be called UI.R, right? Okay, can you identify elements in your script? Can you identify where title panel is and compare whatever name is to your actual display. Can you see where a sidebar panel is? And can you see where your uh, main panel is? Just scroll through the script and kind of familiar, uh, get familiar with its structure. So try to point where it is and um, uh, so you can learn a little bit how it's structured. All right, let's look at our color uh, definitions, and it's sometimes important. So we have three different colors, and you probably noticed in the script. <coughs> the characters, which is our basically words here, are in quotes, and they green. It's good for the future debugging. If you have a string of characters and it's not shown green, it means you're missing quotes. So you see here, for instance, choose a book, Choose a book a character. It has to be in quotes, and it's green. Perfect. Now we have some numbers here, and what color are numbers? Everybody see it? It's blue. And the black color typically are functions, and comments also green, but they have hashtag. All right. So how do you feel about reading script? You feel better. All right. Great. Now let's uh, question. Yeah, so you've got you've got a couple of, of things. You've got selection and you've got choose a book. And selection is an actual option from possible things that mm -hmm. our select input could be, right? Whereas right. choose a book is the text that titles that mm -hmm. area. Choose a book's it's what, the what are the other what's the easiest way to see what the other options are other than selection? Is this in the in the shiny documentation yeah. or is this gonna auto prompt this in the We'll look at it's called widgets. It's called shiny widgets, and okay. there is different widgets. And if you notice here, it says select input, so yeah. they may have different widgets. Select um, radio button, or select different types, and they will all have always. And we'll talk about selection. It's what you give a name to. It's like your ID. As a matter of fact, uh, it's good to have it right now. Then I'm going to repeat it like in 15 slides, so you kind of re. Um, Reemphasize what we're talking. So selection, mm -hmm. it's what you call this specific uh, placeholder. It's your ID. How can you find the user selection? You name it selection. So anywhere in the script, if you want to use their selection, you will have to uh, use the word selection. It will be like input, dollar sign, selection. There will be ID to this selection. Choose a book, it's what they call value, and this case, it means actually what you, what they see, basically. It could be anything, and really it doesn't matter what you write here. What really matter is the first ID, and you have to remember what you call it in this case. Now, in this select input widget, because it just provides you um, specific like templates, widget templates, 
this select input has additional option. The option for you would be whether you want already something to be there when the user start application. Sometimes you want just a blank. In this case, they want you to already have one choice made. And it's probably made somewhere in the server.r. You don't have to worry about it. But as soon as you know user changes, it changes reactively. But if you notice here, it says choices equals books, right? So somewhere in the server.r, or maybe in global.r, it will define what books means. And you can define your own. It is a package. Mm -hmm. Books is a package. Mm -hmm. Books is just a, one of the, um, you could say, if you knew the name of, um, you know, this is the word cloud of like a three different um, books, books, like Romeo and Juliet and something else. So you could define, so when you start application first, which book was selected? The, the first one, whatever. So somewhere in the script, let's not talk like too into detail and find it, somewhere in the script, it's defined what has to be selected. But this is not package. This is data set, actually. Is books a variable we defined before? It was defined before. This is defined by, don't forget, this application already built in, and somebody already defined what books is. When you build your own application, you can skip this option choices, or you can say, my choice is going to be what exactly? Meaning, the, which the book? Task. Yeah, which book? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So then you have um, slider input. There's another widget. And each widget had its own options, right? In slider input, for instance, what is the ID name? Can you find it? It's the very first value, or the very first, it says freak for frequency. So this is going to be your ID that <coughs> in the future, if you need to use it, then you have to refer to this input by input uh, dollar sign freak. It gives you whatever the user <coughs> put in. Right now, by default, it was the choice of person who created app. You have minimum selected, maximum selected, this is defined, and the value is selected. So you could left it blank, nothing <coughs> would be selected, but in this <coughs> case, it's already selected. So the point to take from this, actually, is that when you build your uh, design of your web application, you can decide what's the first thing that users see. If you want already data be seen, in this case, it's already some book, it's already some value, or you want just a blank and let user decide. Could so this is what- Isn't it already, it's just set to a Value that's not specified yeah. here. It's choices it's is just defining the list of options. Uh, choices, it's uh, choices here. It's already defined. But the person who defined it, he already had a variable. It's called books that points it to the book that he decided to uh, to choose. No, books is the list of options. Mm -hmm. The value that it's picking isn't defined there. It's just default. Right. The first one in the list of books. For uh, for instance, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The value is not specified. Yeah, but you could specify it strictly this book, or this ID, probably. Excellent. And, um, all right. Remember I mentioned about HTML tags? So if you're familiar with HTML, that's how you can add additional visual kind of parameters to your website. Think of that as a kind of website application. And it's quite similar. So we have headers, H1, H2, H3. Then we have line breaks, BR. Then we have paragraph and HR for line. For more instructions, feel free to go to this tag glossary. For instance, if you want to embed image, audio, um, video, or if you want to embed URL. So all those tags are uh, given. They're slightly different than HTML, but they're very similar. All right, so uh, if you notice, we said before, strings or characters are green, and then quotes. When you add paragraph or header, you are going to add some characters, right? So what you see in, in parentheses, this is place where you put your uh, parameter. In this case, it's the name or whatever uh, string character. So for instance, if you want to add uh, header one and give a name, you put it inside parentheses and don't forget quotes, right? The same with paragraph. You put paragraph 
and in parentheses, you put your parameter and in quotes what it is. Now, practice number two. You are going to navigate in your R script and at UI, uh, U, um, UI that R script to the place where it says title panel, if you can find it. And I'm going to ask you to change a title first. Right now it says, I don't know, word cloud, whatever it says. Change it to your own title. So you just need to change something between those quotes. Then I'm going to ask you to add header two, which is going to be subtitle right below title panel. There's something extremely important, and if you pay attention right now very strongly to what I'm going to say, it may save you a couple of hours of debugging. All right, pay attention. Pay attention. All right. So we are inside. If you see the parentheses, um, yeah, parentheses. It's going to be another parenthesis somewhere to close it. So we open something and we close it. What's inside are options, right? We can add more options or just one option. What's extremely important, and everybody forgets that, myself as well, we need to separate those options with comma, except the last option right before the parentheses. And what it does, it just separates different options. It's considered the least of different things. So when you start adding new things now inside your page, consider it's like your page, you need to add comma between them. This is extremely important, and it's usually a headache if you don't uh, pay attention, because then you have to find it where it is. Okay, so you are going to add subtitle, you're going to add line break, and you're going to add horizontal line, you're going to save your file, and you're going to run your app. And don't forget commas. Okay, there's your practice number two. Pay attention to commas. Thank 
this click here link. So what you have to do is you will comment out this link, then you will add a paragraph, anything you'd like at the beginning. Remember, when you comment something out, place hashtag at the beginning of the line. And truly, uh, all you have to worry about, don't forget commas, and run it again. So in this case, we work with the main panel to learn how to comment things out and how to add paragraphs. Those paragraphs get very handy when you build the application It tells a uh, user what to do or describe what to do. You can have a, as much text as you want or as little as you want, but sometimes they're very handy to add or before or after certain things. So in this case, before plot, we added some description to it. And then if you can, uh, save file and run the app again. Shiny web app. 
So go ahead and go to Shiny Web App, and then you give a choice to create Shiny application. All right, let me walk you through different options here. So first of all, the application name that is here, it's important it will become your folder name. It's also important if you deploy your application and become part of URL. So that's a time where you should come up with a good name that represents something or something that you can um, uh, tell user uh, to do. And you have application types. Do you remember the very first demo that you had with run example? What was the name of the file? It didn't call ui.r, it called something else. It was app. It was app.r. So there's two options for you to create Shiny app. Would you use just one file and call it app, and you just have split between user interface and the server in one, so you have single file, or you have multiple file when you have UI and server. My personal preference always go with two files because I have strict uh, division between what goes on the web design and what goes to the function. But if you have very small application, you can easily do one single file. So it works. Now, let's select multiple file. Let's select um, your directory. You can place it inside the work folder today. And let's click on create. And what's good about it, it creates two files for you. Even it has already some kind of demo in it, but it doesn't matter. We just want to create something on our own. So you should have UI and server show up on your uh, on your R Studio editor. The tricky part, if you work on different applications at the same time, like myself, you have so many UIs and servers on your uh, R editor open, it gets confusing. But uh, right now, you probably have four different UIs open. All right. So where do we put uh, functions and data and other things and what file we use server.r. We do put all our design, remember it always go to ui.r. Right. That's our distribution. Okay. Now let's run this giving to us for free sample. Let's run this app and it's um, famous gazer data. additional like widget things you can change different position and layout and you can play if you'd like to switch uh, side of bar layout from left to right but this is just additional don't have to do it what we um, need to talk about is layout in general uh, if you notice this default layout has sidebar title and main panel but it's not the only unique layout that you can choose from and I have um, a good example, this is a good article that allow you to see different variation, different layout, for instance, you have different like, columns. Uh, think of website. You want a menu, you want a content, or how you want to position different, um, different content boxes of your application, please consult layout guide. They provide those chunks of code that allow you to uh, kind of customize your application. It's very uh, useful thing to do. All right, like for instance, this is default. This is tab set layout, oh, uh, much better looking. And you can add different functions, for instance. OK. Widgets. We're all eager to talk about widgets, because they give us a lot of uh, options. And if you look at widgets, they're important because they are user interaction with our application. So again, if your application does not require user, you don't need to have those input widgets. But if they do, then uh, you can consult uh, different types. So you can have 
buttons. You can have single checkbox, for instance, uh, date input, uh, help, um, let's say file input. That's where you ask user to upload something. Then you can have radio buttons. You've seen slider input. You can have text input. For instance, if you're working on surveys, you can build your survey as well and collect data that way. Just collect text input and a uh, variety of options. And I suggest you later on uh, after today, maybe look through a couple of tutorials because they give you those little blocks of code <coughs> that you can just paste and copy and you modify maybe how many buttons you want or how you would like to name your uh, widget, basically. All right. We already noticed, and we talked earlier, that widgets have different options. If you remember a slider input widget, have minimum, maximum, and value. Uh, for instance, what else we had? Um, select button or select book. It has value of choice. Right, so they all have additional options, select or value. And you can place them pretty much anywhere in the sidebar or main panel where you want to draw attention to your uh, data. Okay. As we speak earlier, we have ID, which is extremely important to your widget, and we have a label. And label is what, that's what it's seen on the display. That's what the user see. It's kind of a red flag. Here, user insert your text or do your selection, all right? Now, this is an example of file input. I have file and file input. So which one is ID or name and which one is the label that goes to display? So which one is ID? File. file. Mm -hmm. And label, file input. That's what users see, but we never use it anywhere else. We use only file when we want to connect input with our data kind of and output. Mm -hmm. All right, this is important. Get it? Check mark? Perfect. All right. Uh, I'd like you to now look, run your app, uh, and look at the script and identify a couple of those widget elements right now in your script. So can you identify a couple of your widgets and how they relate to your app. I just ask a quick question about IDs. Yeah. So you're you're naming something, right? And you'll name it somewhere else in your code. Mm -hmm. So it's like a variable. It's a variable. It is variable. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you're just saying with quotes, this variable I've named elsewhere is right. going to mm -hmm. be the use, ID. Yeah. Use quotes okay. here because you kind of you put it, use it as a character first. Yeah, so you stay away from things that are already named in the R environment, right? This is not a separate environment, so something like F, capital F or capital T, you should avoid as IDs because you'll overwrite true or false. I think here you could say input dollar sign F, it's because it comes from input dollar sign. That's how you uh, point to the Okay, because they're, yeah, they're a variable, yeah. essentially. Yeah, I would consider it as a variable, but like specific to you. Okay, and so you don't need to worry about other names. In but the same thing mm -hmm. applies to no spaces and no um, symbols, mm -hmm. yeah. Except that you can say C yeah, or F. Yeah, and case sensitivity. It will be important. All right, did you find uh, widgets? What are those widgets? In your uh, UI, you can look at your UI script. Slider. We have slider input, that's a widget. Any other? I think there are two. And slider and uh, whatever the. Uh, yeah, so that would be a. Uh, Slider board, slide, slider input, and um, I guess that's it, yeah. All right, so let's move on and see and discuss about input and output because this is very uh, important. So we can, what's the name of widget to input files? Input, uh, file input. However, how do we know what file to a user will input? So we can restrict, and let's say, of course we can tell the user, 
um, uh, upload CSV file or upload text file or PDF file. So we could we would say um, or choose or upload file so we can modify this part. But how do we know that actually user is doing the right job? So we can actually specify, and this is another um, option that we can impose on user, we can specify what files are accepted, for instance, whether it's uh, JPEG or whether it's uh, text plane, etc. So this is for us to um, use and show user. Now, if you um, still learning R, this is a good place to stop for, the se uh, for a second and remind ourselves. So why do we have all those things in quotes? These are our strings, right? But now, what does this C stands for? Anybody knows what that C uh, function in R? Concatenation. It's like concatenation. We have sort of, I would say, easy to remember, kind of list of things together, right? So we uh, putting things together, combining even better, combining those two, and we're separating by comma. If we only need one, we don't need the C, we just have quotes and text plane, for instance. But if you have several elements you want to put together, in R you would use C in parentheses, and then you separate them with comma. All right, good. Now, let's look at connection between widgets with user, the main part of the um, gist of Shiny reactivity. So we already seen it. We create user input by using input, right? And output is what we display, uh, how we display it, right? Okay. Um, there's different things that you can display based on different things that get uh, input uh, inputted, I would say. For instance, you can render, that's basically how you display things, that's your output. You can render plot, render text, render table, so all those things, and I have a link, it'll, it'll come with a little bit learning curve to figure out what you need. And I would suggest to start with something simple. That's why using those templates is the best way to learn, because you first you read and get familiar with how it's done and uh, become proficient in it. Then you start adding your own elements and change little by little to kind of modify your app. For instance, um, render image. When you get to the point you'd like to render image, remember you need to obtain image from something, right? Then you have to look at what option for input are. Um, so how do you input uh, image from user, for instance? So those things are, just think of when you build your application, plan strategically. What are you going to ask for input? What are you going to ask or how are you going to output or what kind of things you're going to output uh, in display. And consult, I'm constantly look for different, um, so our studio has a lot of articles, like helpful articles, and if you just Google certain things like output or render plot, it gives you all the details and parameters you need, and you can use those little block, uh, code blocks, and just paste and copy and start with that, so you can later on modify it. So that's probably the best way to do it. Now, if you look at reactivity input, if you, from today, just remember this page, this slide, it's excellent. Uh, this is the most important thing to see how it's structured, how Shiny works. All right, so first of all, we have reactive function. And uh, now if you notice, I'm switching from UI, which is just display, to functions. Remember where the function goes? Goes to server.r. That's where you put all your functions. <coughs> now, since those are not um, design things, those are functions, there is slightly different syntax how you put different parameters. If you notice reactive, you have a parentheses and square bracket, no, curly bracket. And of course, you have to end with curly bracket and parentheses. If you look at the UI file, you never see in curly brackets. It's always going to be those just um, parentheses. So that's a huge difference. And you, when you the more you start doing that, the more you've seen it. And this is a block of code. 
this is different options. So in different options in UI, remember, we need to put commas. When you use a block of functions, we don't separate them by commas. So you can have a block with 10 different lines in your function, and you do not separate them by comma because they're just different blocks of functions. However, if you work on UI on a file inside, so this is not a function, this gives you different options or parameters that you just separate by commas. So this is uh, crucial to kind of figure out how the syntax works. So again, functions, it's block of different commands, so we don't put any comma between them. And we can have a block of function as long as, I don't know, 100 lines if you want. It doesn't matter. As long as you don't forget to close it. All right? Okay. And when you call function reactive, R knows that something, you don't have any data in it. You just built around potential data. So right now, you cannot run it because you don't have anything. And what this specific function requires, uh, some kind of data, that is read from CSV file. And where does it come from? It comes from somewhere it's called input file, or whatever ID you had for your user to upload file. All right? And it also, in this case specifically, it looks at the data path in order to upload file. But don't worry about this um, detail. What's important is it's reactive. So if there's nothing in, it returns nothing. So web application sit there blank. It doesn't complain, it's just blank. So return nothing means I don't have anything to show. But as soon as you have something like input file, it starts doing its own thing. And you notice what's the end of a re reactive function, and it's important. Reactive functions should give you something in return, some data. So we have return my data. What is my data in this case? That's your own naming of the variable that you create from this CSV file. So my data can be called data, file, or v1, for instance, but you have to just repeat this the same name here, all right? So remember, reactive function require return. It's a function. There's no commas separating lines, and it goes to server.op. So this is crucial. Now, whenever you're ready to uh, utilize this data, uh, tell me, what is the name of reactive function here? My file. So when you would like to access data from reactive function, it has to be like this. It's not just my file, because it will be looking for some kind of variable. It's looking for actual function. This is another important thing to remember. So if you um, point or try to access data that come from reactive function, you uh, access it this way because it will return data. You don't have to specify, for instance, my data because it's already in it. All right. So, um, question to you would be: uh, What do you think render data table does? So it will produce something. So it goes to kind of our output, right? it will produce it in the data format. So just a built-in um, function, if you wish, that no already, you don't have to worry about how to display it, it's already built in. So what it does, it render this CSV file as a like Excel spreadsheet. All right, so my file is reactive. Next, what is, um, how do we know five, uh, file one, where it come from? They come from our file input widget that we already name it as a file one. Remember, this is our ID. We could name it as F. It doesn't matter, but if you call it F, it has to be called F here. So that's how it gets connected. This, the rest is kind of, doesn't matter much. It's how you want to display it. So the main thing is you create reactive function. How do you link to the create, uh, reactive function is you use the name of that function. How do you link output with input? You just remember those IDs and link them by ID. All right, any question about this? This is the crucial, maybe most complicated and 
I don't know, less beautiful slide there. Uh, okay, what do you think? Reactivity, questions. Input, output, questions. What's the most important thing to remember when you input files? Oh, question. Which scenario do we use the reactive function? Is it only by doing input output or the So reactive function you would need is definitely when you have some kind of input because you don't know what's coming. Yeah, it's only one time you need it. So if you have your application where you know the same algorithm runs all over again, you just build it that way, then you don't need to worry about the reactive function. You can just have output. Load the data by default and output the same way. But as soon as you want to change something, think of statistical application, and I can share with you at the end, where um, you have a, you load a comma separate file and you build regression analysis and you teach your students how to run regression analysis. So the students select their own variables to run different analysis. So it becomes input. Or you can build this application for a class with already built in factors and it is the same all the time. In that case, you don't need any reactive function. So yeah, it, it depends. But it's definitely more um, visually engaging when you can click on something, right, and cha see the changes. As soon as you need to move the slider, then it becomes input. But you may not need reactive function because the data is not changed. So it uh, depends on how you built and what's the purpose of your application. Great question. All right. Um, finally, deployment. So a couple of things uh, you can do. And uh, the best is to, for now, that's what I've been doing, I'm using shinyapps.io, which gives you uh, free access to build five applications only. If you need more, then you have to do with the basic account. I forgot, like uh, $400 per year. Then you can build unlimited number of applications. Or if you, let's say if you use different application different time, you don't have to keep them active all the time. You can still keep the range of five free just by changing different applications. Or you can build application that as long as you need just one application with including five applications. I don't know, you can, you can be smart and kind of still keep a free range for yourself if you want. Okay, so if uh, I didn't ask you ahead of time, and uh, you probably can do it later on, if you sign up for this account on Shiny Apps, if you look where your uh, editor right now um, UI application is, right next to run app, there's a little blue thing. And if you click at the menu, it says publish application. So if you click on that publish application, it asks you to link your account in Shiny Apps that I know to your application that right now here, and it will deploy for you. And it gives you a URL, and you can um, share with the world, basically. And this is how you would add your account, and it will be there every time you deploy something. And of course, you can give a title. You can check what things you want to be shared on the web, um, what things you want to skip, for instance. Uh, you can control, and then you publish. If you go to Shiny App, by itself. That's what I do all the time to monitor my apps. I have uh, a lot of them and I'm just curious to see you know, how much traffic it gets, you know, is it useful or not. I also can see different metrics. Uh, first of all, if some application are running right now by someone, like your application, someone can run, right? So it shows you the running or sleeping, or you can archive, it provides you a lot of statistics which is show you how important your application, for instance, is or uh, other things. And you can modify um, how much um, memory it uses and you can maybe optimize something. And something else that Jane may be later on introducing, maybe in the spring, is how to deploy Shiny application of Jetstream. There's the good pros. You're gonna have your Shiny app uh, as much work as you need, because remember, if you use Shiny app um, from our studio, you have limitation of how much memory it takes, how much processing power it takes. Here you may have used everything for like running uh, complicated computation, 
And um, of course, you have help here. <laughs> and uh, but there's a couple of cons that uh, probably Jane will introduce next semester about seed and um, other things that you may need to take a uh, Linux 101, etc., to kind of get used to it. But it's it's a good opportunity, good uh, alternative as well. All right, and. Um, I know we're running out of time, but there's a couple of applications I've been using extensively. One for statistics, for instance, and one for text mining. And every time I find some interesting function, I just add to it. And what I do, I just, instead of running code anymore in R for statistics, I know what I need. So I just go to the application, upload my file, and just run it. I have conditional trees, another random forest, another regression. So to me, it's like I use it in research a lot, and I give my students to use it so they can learn it. and um, I also have a little like mini art code blog so they can see it. But truly, it's just it's good for me and it's good for teaching as well, kind of both worlds. All right. So thank you so much for your patience. Thanks you for doing all this heavy load of work today. And hopefully you enjoy it. And hopefully uh, we get uh, how many 20 new users or 30 new users of Shiny uh, in the world, right? All right. Thank you so much. Questions. Can you embed these into other websites? Yes. Uh, like, for example, a WordPress website. You, you should be able to get a little widget that allows you to embed Shiny apps that into a regular page. I haven't embedded my Shiny into other page. I know I embedded something into Shiny. But I think it, there's a, uh, I don't know how to do it because I haven't done it, but absolutely you can embed it. Yeah. And every Shiny function is just HTML code. Right. So it can go into a website right. because it, it's HTML. It's just, it's it's just a wrapper. Mm -hmm. In China, you can actually extract it as an embedded HTML and copy it. Mm -hmm. So when you start um, in spring, the Shiny Initiative Group, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be great for everyone to get all those questions. And yeah. So so what um, what Ola just said, we're going to be starting kind of a users group or a group around Shiny, um, looking at how we can possibly uh, get funding for a Shiny server at UC, but also to share uh, resources and share ideas. So there's several other there's faculty, there's students that are very interested. So we'll be doing that, starting that up in uh, January, February. I didn't mention on purpose the third option, which would be the greatest option to have, which is Shiny server. But it's very expensive for the school. But it means also the more demand it comes from the faculty from research the more maybe response you'll get so start using it start demanding it and mm -hmm. who knows maybe you get the server access to it and that was one of the reasons that phil taylor who kept asking questions in the last session was there because he's um we're working to create maybe a core facility with compute and these sort of resources in it so looking to have some funding so anytime that professors and faculty and students ask for these the better yeah. Excellent. And of course, uh, feel free to contact me. And of course, remember the R Studio articles, your good friend to go first. They provide a lot of good tutorials and information. And, uh, and of course, I'll be available. Jane will be happy to assist you too. Yeah. And the two, the gentleman, so um, Mark is the science and engineering librarian. So he's available for help. Richard um, is the data visualization specialist out of the Bronstein Library. And where the and okay, so, so the libraries has so that, that's uh, you know Mark's and, Mark and please be a great if you resource. yeah and if you are user yourself and you consider like you need some support or just want to be in a group with uh, um, closed mind people so Richard initiative is to create our user group <coughs> at UC yeah. so make sure to become part of it and hopefully it will be shiny user group as well and mm -hmm. and grow so make sure to. Give your and not just a UC region. I mean, yeah, local. start with UC and then. So yeah. start with yeah. Interested in joining an R user group? Come see me today so I can at least get your email. Yep, perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank thanks you for the opportunity. You.